When I was thinking through this sermon today, um, I started thinking about how scandalous the church actually was in Rome. You guys didn't know it, but you're kind of a bunch of scoundrels, right? You, you, you really are. You are in this building. Now, of course, in today's society, in today's culture, we, people wouldn't think anything of it. You're here, and, and that's fine. But if you were to take this church in this setting and go back to Rome, people would think that you guys are, are scandalous, right? Because, you, I mean, just think about it. you got women sitting close to the front, and, and the men are in towards the back, and that's just odd. You can't have things like that. And, and they have all these different class distinctions. You have Jew and Gentile, slave and free, barbarian, Scythian. You know, you've got all these different class distinctions, and here you all, all are sitting in the same area together and united. Like what I, I think it's beautiful when, when, I, when I think about it, but if you were to take this church and go back to Rome during the time that Paul is writing to the letter of Colossians, those Roman citizens would think that you're out of your mind, right? Because what, how can you have any order in a society if you don't if you have such loose standards? That might be how they thought of it. Is, is that you have loose standards. And so Paul has given us this new identity. You find the new identity in chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, since then you've been raised with Christ. We know that point, right? We went into the waters of baptism. We were united with Christ in his death. Then we came up out of the waters of baptism and we were united with him in his resurrection. And since you've been united or raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated, right? Because he's sitting right there at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning, and our identity is fixed on things above. Our heart is fixed on things above. Our mind is fixed on things above, not on earthly things. See, when we were united with Christ in the waters of baptism, it should have changed our entire identity of, of who we believe ourselves to be. In fact, instead of asking the question, who do you believe yourself to be, maybe you want to start thinking more in the lines of, of Scripture, whereas the idea is, what does God have to say about you? Who does he think that you are? He created you to be good, right? You are, you are a child of God. And once you've accepted that new identity, there's this really great thing that happens. And you see this in chapter 3, verse 11, where he talks about the new humanity. And he says that here there is neither Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, for, but Christ is all and in, is in all. And that's who we are, right? Those distinctions that once separated us, male and female, slave and free. I mean, I know that we don't live in those, those cultures where you have slavery. But those, those class distinctions, those racial distinctions, they've all been destroyed. They've all been broken down according to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. We, we are all one in Christ. Now, that would have been strange in a Roman society, in, in a, a, a society that valued these differences. I mean, if you were a Roman citizen living at that time, you had, you had more freedoms and greater rights than non-Roman citizens. If you were a woman living in this time, you had no rights. If you were a child, you were considered property, right? And yet here we are in a church where there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, barbarian, Scythian, for Christ is all and is in all. When we've been raised with Christ, it changed who we were. We have a new identity. And in fact, that identity is given to us in verse 12, where it says this, therefore, as God's chosen people, you want to pick up your identity? Who are you in Christ? You are a chosen person, right? Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Who are you in Christ? A chosen person who is holy, set apart, and dearly loved by God. You should be feeling that. God dearly loves you. This was a, a, a distinction that the people of Israel would have considered their own, only belonging to the Jewish people. In fact, we read about God giving them this identity in Deuteronomy chapter 7. And so I want to read it. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses uh, 6 and 7. It says this. These commandments that I give you today are to be in your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them 
on, as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them down on your door frames and your, how, and your household houses and on your gates. See, we are a people that are dearly loved by God and because of that, a chosen people and a people that are supposed to teach these, these decrees to their children and to bind them on our hearts. We are supposed to be holy people, right? Dearly loved people. And that would have been an idea that was scandalous in the Roman world. Scandalous because of what they thought about other people. And I, I, I have this book, it's Christian uh, History Made Easy. Craig taught him this book a while ago. And uh, I found it interesting. But here's, here's something that... Uh, the early people, the first century Romans, would have thought about Christians. Um, this this excerpt is excerpt is from this writer named Celsius, who's who's writing in the first century, and this is what they thought about Christians. He said this: because Christians admit ad, admit that ignorant people are worthy of their God, Christians show that they want to convert only foolish, dishonorable, stupid people. And only slaves, women, and little children. Now, let me make that clear again in case I didn't. This is what a non-Christian person living in the first century thought about the church. They only want to admit ignorant people. Right? They, they believe that ignorant people are worthy of their God. Christians show that they want and can convert only foolish, dishonorable, and stupid people. Only slaves, women, and little children. So in that first century... People didn't think much of the church, did they? They didn't think much of those early Christians, except for maybe they were, they were ignorant. And the reason why they thought that is because inside the church, there was Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and free ma female. They were, Christ is in all and, and was all. And, and from an outside looking in at that church, people would think, well, the church is scandalous. It's, it's weird. It's strange. How is it that all those people can be, be loved by God? And, and the, the way that that is made possible is because of what Christ accomplished on the cross. See, when we were united with Christ in his death, we were raised in this resurrection reality that says that, that uh, our identity is fixed with him. No longer on those other things that used to define us, but we are chosen people, holy and dearly loved. And as we think about that new identity, Paul is now going to write and show how that is supposed to impact our lives all, all around, all, all together. How is that new, new identity, that new type of Christian, how are they supposed to live within the church? How, what is their family group supposed to look like? And although he writes in the context of slavery, what is their work ethic supposed to be? And so what I want to do is I want to, to use this sermon to kind of show how that new identity is chosen and dearly loved should impact our worship services, how we worship. It should impact our family structures, and it should impact our work ethic. So let's look at the first one. Christ, the Christian's new identity makes the message of Christ the center of worship. Our, our identity in Christ should mean that the message of Christ is the center of our worship. And we're going to find that in verse 15 of chapter um, 3. 15 and following, he says this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hear hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with, a grateful, with gratitude in your heart. Right? So he, he shows us what this new identity, how it should impact us. And the first thing he says is that the peace of God should, should rule our hearts since we're all members of one body. Do you feel that? That new identity that it's not so much specifically about yourself, but you are part of a community? And Paul likes to use body as the image of the church. When he's usually talking about body, he's talking about the church as not an organization, as an organism that builds, that's built up to become more like Christ, right? 
So, so he, the first thing we have to see is that we're all members of one body, and that's made possible because of the peace of Christ that rules in our hearts. Now, that could be the peace that, that Jesus gives us, because how, how great is it to know that we have been reconciled with God? The division, the wall of hostility, the sin that separated us from God has been removed because of what he accomplished on the cross, and now we have peace with God. And if we start there, with peace with God, and it, we allow that to rule in our hearts, we overflow with gratitude, all part of one church body. I, I think that's, that's pretty important. And Paul tells us how that peace was accomplished in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, he says this, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in the flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two and making peace. So the peace that we have that's available in the body of Christ was made possible because of what Christ did on the cross. And we are members of that body. I think Paul might get the, the metaphor of the body when he's on the road to Damascus and he's there to persecute Christians. And, and Jesus speaks to him from heaven and he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul had to consider how his persecution of individual Christians was impacting the person of Christ. Maybe from that point, he starts to see the body of Christ as representing all those individual Christians who, who make up that body and are united in, in the reconciliation that happens because of the cross. But we are all members of that one body. And because of that, there should be one message that rules every church service, every worship song, every Bible study. He tells us the message... In Colossians chapter 3, he tells us that, uh, verse 16, the message of Christ should dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit. So what message do we preach? Jesus. He's the message that we preach, and maybe it's the message of Jesus. You might think of him standing on, on the mountain as he tells the people the way that uh, you can have a blessed life. He tells the people to be salt and light. He tells the people about the rules of the kingdom. He tells the people about the ethics of the kingdom. And then he says, if you build your house on this rock, on, on, the, on my words, the one who hears my words and puts them into practice is the one who builds the house on this rock, right? Whatever storms of life will come, they will not knock down that house. So I guess if the, the church builds itself up on the message that Christ spoke, we have a foundation that no matter how much it rains and how much it snows is not going to be washed out from under us, is it? But the message could also be the message of Christ, right? His death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and he's sitting at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning until that last enemy is defeated. And so we have Jesus, the message of Christ, as a king, and we're part of that kingdom and his subjects. That message should be the one thing that stands out in church, shouldn't it? It should be the center of every song, Bible study, sermon series. The message of Christ should dwell inside of us. Sometimes I think that's, that's one of the harder things for me, specifically, because doesn't it seem like there's so much garbage in the world? Like, man, we could get messages from all over the place. And we like these, like, digital safe spaces where we only listen to the messages that we want to hear, right? And disregard everything that might conflict with our biases. And, you know, I, I get enough messages outside of this church. You know what I want to hear when I come to church? The message of Christ. I want it to be what is front and center. I want it to be what dwells inside me. I want it to be the thing that I build my house on because if I come to church and I hear more garbage from the world, then what's different? But we're supposed to be different. And so as a church, the message of Christ 
That should be our, our foundation, right? And how, how, how do we speak it? In songs and hymns and spiritual songs, teaching and admonishing one another, right? You can go back to that church in, in Acts chapter 2 where they met together daily with glad and sincere hearts, sincere hearts. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, to prayer. They were united and had all things in common. Isn't that the kind of church you want to be with? Isn't that the kind of church you want to be part of? One that is so devoted to Christ that it becomes the most important thing, who he is and how he shapes you. See, our new identity, fixed in heaven, not on earthly things, should come together as one group, no longer identified by earthly divisions like Jew or Gentile, slave or free, but understanding that as a group, we are God's holy and chosen people, dearly loved. And when we come together, it should be peace and thankfulness that define us, and it should be the message of Christ that is number one. That, that's a... That's a something we all have to think about. Because if you notice, in verse 12, it talks about how this happens, and it says, um, actually this is for verse 16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom, songs, and, and those types of things. Do you notice how it says one another? As if you are not just a passive person inside of the church. Your job is not to show up and just listen to a sermon. We're supposed to encourage, teach, admonish, sing to one another with songs of the Spirit. See, in order to have the message of Christ dwell in us deeply, every person has to leave the garbage of the world behind and come into the church and present that message of Christ to one another, encouraging and teaching. So it starts with each one of you, because we all make up part of that body of Christ, right? The message of Christ should be number one. My second point, and this is where I'm going to start dodging landmines, I suppose. But this is, uh, this, my second point is this. It's, it's uh, the lordship of Christ should be center of our family. The lordship of Christ should be center of our family. And so what we have is, is Paul showing us this new identity that's no longer about earthly divisions, but as, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. And as we come together as one body, it should be the message of Christ that's number one, first and center. And now, now leaving the church, he moves on to household codes. And we have to always ask when we come to household codes if they're descriptive or prescri prescriptive. Is Paul telling us how to live or is he describing how to live in the culture that he was he was in. And of course we know, like with his, his household codes that are discussing slavery, that they're definitely descriptive, right? They're about how a slave is supposed to live in a world of slavery. And so we have to, to continue to ask those questions when it has to do with marriage, when it has to do with how to raise children, when it has to do with our work ethic. And there's going to be one rule that is number one, and it should be the rule that defines how we Go to church, what, what's most important there, what's most important in our family, and what's most important in our work lives. And that one rule, we brought it up last week, is in verse um, 17, where he says this, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So that is the number one rule. Every code that comes after this has to be grounded on verse 17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is going to apply to your family relationships and to your work ethic, right? So let's start first with family. This is going to be verse 18, and it's going to go all the way through 21. Here's what it says. I'm going to say this quickly because my wife's in the back. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting to the Lord, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything. And I'm going to repeat that because my kids are in the back. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Yeah. He was excited to obey. The father loving the children, well, he might be happy about that one too, I'm sure. But you, you notice these household codes is now going on to how you're supposed to interact at home and uh, how are you supposed to be a good husband, a good wife, a good child, a good father, a good parent. And there's one rule that's going to, to be the most important 
important, the foundation for all of these things, and that is whatever you do in word and deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. How, how do you be a good wife? Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. How do you be a good husband? Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. How about a child? Whatever you do in word and deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I could go on to parents and fathers. See, everything we do should be grounded in who Jesus is and the Lordship of Christ. It helps me to be a good father. It helps me to be a good husband. And if I don't have that first one down, I'm neither a good father nor a good husband, right? Now, we have to, to talk a little bit about, about this. Um, Paul is writing to a culture that is a lot different than our own. I mean, women were owned, not, not married for, for love so much. And uh, children didn't have rights. That's different than ours, right? I mean... Not, not, not in, in the Roman culture, very few women even had like any form of, of education. And that's different than the culture that we're in. So we have to, again, question, is Paul being descriptive or prescriptive when he's giving us these household codes? But I wanted to, to like set the stage just so you know how women were viewed in this culture. I found a, a quote from Aristotle who wrote the book Politics. And this is what he said about women, and this is the kind of thing that, that, uh, that permeated in the Roman society. Here's what he says. He says, For that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary but also expedient. For the hour, from the hour of their birth, some are marked for subjection and others to rule. Again, the male is by nature superior and the female inferior. And the one who rules and the other is ruled. This principle of necessity extends to all mankind. Do you see what he said? Just so you can, can understand the, the kind of soup that, that uh, Paul is, is the book of Colossians and the Colossian church was, was brewing in. He, they, they were a culture and a world that believed that women were inferior by design, by nature. And because of that, they needed to be subordinate because it is the man's job to rule. And then Paul comes along and plants a seed that says there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male nor female, for Christ is all and is in all. And he plants a seed that gives women value and says they're not inferior in any way. In fact, Christ is all and is in all. And he doesn't command men to rule over their wife. Instead, every household code is going to be anchored to the lordship of Christ. So in verse 18, when he says, wives, submit, submit to your husband, he says, as is fitting to the Lord. See, it's this, this uh, choice. Imagine that, women in that society having a choice to submit not because they're inferior, not because they're forced, but because it's fitting to the Lord, which could describe a limiting factor to it, right? Like you're, you're supposed to submit in ways that line up to what the Lord's will is. I mean, Peter was certainly supposed to submit to the rulers of the Sanhedrin, yet he said to them, you choose what is right to obey you or to obey God. The husband has this other obligation, although I don't think it's much of an obligation. That's the wrong word. The husband is supposed to love his wife. And when we get to Ephesians, we find the way that he's supposed to love his wife. He's supposed to love his wife as Christ loved the church, that he gave himself up for her. I think that's a beautiful way of describing the type of love because greater love has no, no other thing than this, that he laid down his life. Right? That's how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life for us. And so when we think of how husbands are supposed to love their wife as Christ loved the church, I, I was thinking about these codes. And, you know, I can't think that they're exclusive. I mean, would anybody say that the wife is not supposed to love her husband? No? Like, that wouldn't be something we would agree, right? Right? 
The wife should love her husband. You know, in Ephesians, I'll go ahead and read it. Ephesians um, chapter 4, when in that book, Paul gives household codes. He, uh, he gives us some interesting, interesting ones. In Ephesians chapter 4, I believe it's verse 21, or chapter 5, verse 21, he says this, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Isn't that interesting? Now, the next verse, verse 22, if you read it from the NIV, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. But in the Greek, the word submit is not actually in that sentence. The NIV pulls it from the context of verse 21 and inserts it in verse 22. But in verse 21, he's saying that this is a, a group effort. You should all submit to one another, right? In fact, you should all love one another. That's what we're commanded to do, to love one another. There is nothing I, I can think of that, that shows who we are in Christ except for when we act like Jesus did. And he, in his very nature, was God. Didn't consider equality with God something to be taken to his own advantage, but he humbled himself and made himself obedient to even the cross, the lowest of servants, right? being made in human likeness. That's, that's how we know what love is. And the husband certainly should be doing that for his wife. But the wife should be doing that too. We love one another. I believe that marriage relationships ultimately should reflect the gospel. I, I think that's the, the best kinds of marriages reflect the gospel. They're, they're taking off the vices that Paul had talked about earlier, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. They're putting on the virtues that Paul talked about earlier about being humble and gentle and kind. And they make Christ the center. The, the, the lordship of Christ becomes the center of their marriages. And because of that, their marriages reflect the gospel. On top of that, as as children and parents, there's a way that they, they have to interact with one another as well. And you know what's interesting about this is that Paul even in, includes children. You don't think Aristotle included children when he was writing his book, did he? No, what's assumed in verse uh, 20 when it says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord. What's assumed is that there were children in the congregation listening to the letter as it's being writ or read. That would be so countercultural to have women and men, slaves and free, men, like all together, and then children in the room, that they would hear the words, obey your parents. Why? Because, because uh, it pleases the Lord. And all of these things. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wife. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. All of it are, is hinged on the word Lord. In fact, the word Lord is used eight times in the, the section that has to do with household codes here. More than half of the time that the word Lord is used in the entire rest of the book of Colossians, it's used right here. And that's because our identity is now fixed to the lordship of Christ, and it should be what controls our assemblies. It should be what controls our marriages and our children. I, I, want, to, I want you to see how children were thought of in uh, the culture that, that Paul is writing to. And I found this quote. It's from the book of Sirach, which is, is um, a part of the Apocrypha. Not included in the Protestant Bible, right? But in, in your Catholic one, it will. But this is what it says. It says, he who loves his son will whip him often. Right? So that they may rejoice at the way he turns out. Now, I, I, I'm still okay with that. I'm, I'm good. I like to spank my children sometimes. But listen to what he goes on to say. An unbroken horse turns out stubborn, and an unchecked son turns out headstrong. Pamper a child and he will terrorize you. Play with him and he will grieve you. You're not even supposed to play with your children. That's the culture that he's talking to. Don't, do not laugh with him or you will have sorrow with him. And in the end, you will gnash your teeth. 
Give him no freedom in his youth and do not ignore his errors. Bow down his neck in his youth and beat his sides while he is young or else he will become stubborn and disobey you and you will have sorrow of soul from him. Discipline your son and make his yoke heavy so that you may not be offended by his shamelessness. Isn't that interesting? Bow his head down. Make sure that your children walk around like this all the time. And that's, that's, that's the way children were thought of in the, in the Second Temple period, that they should be, like my grandma always said, children should be seen and never heard. Right? And I, I, I think that's, that's interesting, where Paul actually includes children in his letter. But he also says this, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. He cared about your child's mental health. He didn't want them to be discouraged. He wanted them to be encouraged, to, to be built up. See, no matter what relationship you have, it's fixed on the lordship of Christ. And that's why I'm going to go through my third point really quick, right? I, this is, uh, my third point is that Christ should be the center of your work ethic. Christ should be the center of your work, work ethic. And this is the hardest part to prepare for because I was even talking to some friends who are not Christian and they were like, well, what are you preaching about this week? And I said, well, you know, I'm preaching about slaves and masters and how they're supposed to interact with one another. And uh, how do you think that goes over in a non-Christian non group, right? Like that's, that's a tough one. But Paul does, he includes slaves and masters. Inside this section, he says this, slaves obey your earthly masters in everything and do, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you, were, you re will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide for your slaves with, with what is right and fair, because you know that you will have a master in heaven. Right? Now, the first thing we have to get out right away when we're talking about slavery in the New Testament is this is definitely descriptive of how Christians were supposed to live within a society that allowed slavery. Right? Paul is not advocating for slavery. He's saying if this is the situation you find yourself in, this is how you should live. In fact, one verse that makes this really clear, and I want to read it. It's uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. He says this, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. So the point he's making there is that through the spread of the gospel, the world will be changed, right? And so the best thing we can do is spread the gospel. And you can't do that if you're fighting all the time. And so Paul plants a seed of, of human worth inside of these verses by, first of all, including slaves, which would have been scandalous in a Roman society, by including slaves, but by also telling those that they will receive an inheritance and that God doesn't show favoritism and that they have a master in heaven and all of these things which plants a seed of self-worth in somebody that had absolutely none in their society. And as the gospel spread, those walls of Jew, Gentile, slave, free, they broke down. And now we live in a, a, a world where at least the slavery that we're mixed into is not happening every day on our streets, right? I mean, there's still slavery all over the world. Like there, It's still a matter of, of living on this planet, but it's certainly not legal in America, and that's because Paul gives slaves, not Paul because he's not the origin of it, God shapes and changes a person's identity so that Christ is all and in all and they are all chosen people, holy and dearly loved because they have been raised with Christ. See, I think that is, uh, as we consider what, what Paul has to say here, he's saying that who we are in Christ should impact every element of our life. What, what we value inside of our communities, 
The message of Christ should rule and dwell in your heart deeply. What is our family like? It's fitting to the Lord. We love our wives. We, we, we try not to embitter our children, right? What is our work ethic like? See, that's the, the closest application we can come up with slavery and uh, because our economy is different. And, you know, we all have jobs to do. And Paul is saying, work at it with all your heart as if you're working towards the Lord. Whatever you do in word and deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because the Christian identity should be so fixed to who Jesus is that it should shape every area.